morning and welcome to our worship this day. Glad that you are able to join us. Um, we will be having our worship at 1045 in our parking lot. It's clear to snow and so we'll be doing that. Uh, also just a reminder for those who have Sunday school at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings we have our virtual Sunday school and uh, you're welcome to join on that as well. If you need the link you just let us know and we'll get that out to you. Um, one announcement just to uh, upcoming in two weeks on February the 7th, we will be having our annual meeting. Uh, it will be held virtually. Um, so we'll be getting that information as far as how to get um, to link into that through Zoom or by telephone. Um, but we'll be getting that out. But just make a note that uh, our annual meeting will be held on February the 7th at 1030. Um, the links will be sent out as well as this week we will be getting out um, the booklet with all the information you need to know. So um, just put that on your calendar as well. And then we have one announcement this morning from John. Good morning. Today is Volunteer Recognition Sunday uh, here at Central Lutheran. Uh, unfortunately, normally, you would be here in the pews and we would be able to give you a nice reception. But uh, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all the wonderful people that we have here at our church that help make things run, from Dominic, who's currently up uh, running the cameras, to our mu wonderful musicians, uh, to the folks that help with confirmation and Sunday school, uh, and the folks that help with our worship and uh, music ministries, uh, and even our newsletter volunteers. Uh, we couldn't, this church would not run simply without you. Uh, I know that the Worship and Welcome Committee uh, had prepared something that I'm going to read real quick. And, uh, but again, I just want to thank from all of us here at Central um, a very big, uh, I wanted to give you a very big thank you. So here's the statement. Whether visible or behind the scenes, without you we could not meet the ministry needs at, with cent within Central Lutheran. We typically host a reception for all volunteers that includes a short program and refreshments. That is impossible this year due to the current restrictions, but we don't want to miss this opportunity to recognize the dedication of our faithful members who give so generously of their time and energy. So thank you everyone and uh, keep doing what you're doing.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with you. you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice mm. calls upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out on all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Mm. Amen. So let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundance of God's grace. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken system that binds us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and all its resources. We fail to consider the generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone, even before the words are on our tongue. You know them, so receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and the promise of Jesus Christ, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community living out of Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us as in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from Jonah, chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel <clears throat> lesson for this day comes from the Gospel of Mark in the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. 
They went a little further, and he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So again today we get uh, one of the Gospels' account of Jesus calling his disciples. Now this is a little different than our call story we had from last week. Last week in the Gospel of John, it was John the baptizer who was pointing to Jesus as he walked by. And there it said, we are told that his, uh, a couple of his followers left him and went to follow Jesus. But along the way, they took time. Andrew, and Simon, Andrew went out and found his brother Simon and James and John. Others were invited to come and to follow as well. But here in the Gospel of Mark, it's a different. It's a different, seeming a different purpose and a different incentive for Simon and Andrew and for James and John to just pick up and leave everything, to leave everything to follow Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, there seems to be a whole different urgency, an immediacy to everything that takes place. And it begins right at the very beginning here of the Gospel. Jesus comes back. We had just, uh, in the verses just prior, right, Jesus has been baptized. He's He gets swept out into the desert, into the wilderness where he is tempted for 40 days. And now he's come back and he hears that John has been arrested. We will find out a little bit in a couple chapters from now about all the reasons John was arrested. But at this point, we just know that John was arrested. And Jesus, there's this void that kind of takes place. Because John had been out talking and, and calling people to repent and to and to turn away and to turn around. And now this void had taken place and Jesus steps up and steps in. Jesus comes proclaiming the good news of God, saying the kingdom, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near to repent and to believe in the good news. The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Simple words, but we have to kind of maybe break it down a little bit to really truly understand what Jesus is saying. Because so often in the translation into English, we sometimes miss some of the little nuances that come. We don't get that full understanding. And here is one of those times. Because the word that is translated, there's, in the Greek there are two words that get translated often into the English as time. The first is the word chronos, and the second is the word kairos. Chronos we know. Chronos is that marking of time. It's the ticking of seconds on a clock. It's the turning of the page of the, uh, of the calendar. It's that marking of time that we understand in our daily life. That's chronos. But kairos is the word that is used here. And kairos is better understood as, as that the time of marking of royal time. It's the inbreaking of God into the chronos, the time of our lives. It's God inbreaking into our world. This is Kairos time. This is God's time. So Jesus is indicating that the time has come. It's God's time had come for the ushering in of the world of the kingdom of God. That is, we, we have been brought now into the, to God's time. And so Jesus calls us to repent and to believe in the good news. To repent, to to change our minds, to change our hearts so that we might believe in this new understanding, this new reality that God has ushered into our world. The repentances that he calls for is not just individual repentance as we sometimes hear it. It's it's kind of a communal thing. It's a it's a plural setting in, in the Greek, but it's a so it's a communal understanding. We see that because Jesus calls not individuals, but he calls them in pairs and in groups, right? He calls Simon and Andrew to come, to leave their nets and to come and to follow him. 
he calls these brothers to come as co-workers in the kingdom, the kingdom that had come near. Now in Mark, we don't get much of a backstory. We don't know if, as Jesus walks by this day, if James and Aunt John or Andrew and Simon, if they knew Jesus before that very moment in time. We only hear that Jesus, in the story, that Jesus walks by the fishermen. He sees them doing their work, working to catch fish and to mend their nets, and he calls them, and immediately, immediately they cut up and they follow him. They drop everything. Because there's that sense of urgency, a sense that there is no time to waste. In our, in our Bible study the, the other day, as we were talking about this passage, I already said, to me, in the Gospel of Mark, there's just that such urgency that I get this picture in my mind that, that Jesus doesn't even stop to say, come and follow. He just walks by them and says, come and follow me, and they have to hurry to catch up as Jesus continues his way down the seashore. And we often hear this invitation of to come and to follow. But in reality, it's not an invitation, it's a command. Jesus is commanding them to get up and to come and to follow. There's um, kind of like there's nothing else they really could have done to get up, to come. For the time, God's time had come, the kingdom of God had come near, the mission that they had been called to share had already begun. For us, when we hear the stories of Jesus calling, we sometimes make these kind of idealized and marvel at their ability to just leave everything. But in some ways, it doesn't matter if Jesus is inviting them or commanding them. We always just see it as kind of this, this miracle, this wonderful thing that these guys dropped everything and followed Jesus to call, to go, and to follow, and to be in his service. But what if it's more of a modern thing? What if, it, what if we saw it in a more modern setting? What if we said, Jesus walked past the school one day, and he saw teachers grading papers, and he called to them, come and follow me, and they left their desk, and they immediately followed him. Or if we walked past the grocery store, walked by us Midtown, and he saw some, some of the helpers putting in groceries in someone's car, and he says, come and follow me, and they left the grocery bag sitting there on the parking lot and went and followed him. Maybe he's walking down by the lake and he walked past the hospital and he saw some nurses helping some people and he said, come and follow me. And they left their care and they went and they followed him. Immediately stopping at what they were doing to turn and to follow. Now you might say, well, that, you know, pastor, that's not really what the story says. But I think it's closer to what the story says. But surely you think we, we fill in the gaps, right? We think, well, James and John and Andrew and Simon, they must have known Jesus. They must have just been waiting for their friend to come by and say, it's time to get up and to go out and do this, which I am called to do. But as I said earlier, I, we don't know that in this story. We don't know that, that Jesus has even met these four men before this day. But he walks by and he commands them to come and to leave to leave everything, to leave family and friends and job and possessions and to go and to follow him. And sometimes I think we marvel at these stories because we think, well, what wonderful thing it would have been to be, to be called to follow Jesus, to be there in his presence, to do that which God had called them to do. But I think sometimes if, if it actually truly happened, we'd be more like Jonah, right? God called Jonah in in the story, we, the bigger story than the, the few verses we got today. But the bigger story is, you know, right? God called Jonah and said, I need you to go to Nineveh and tell them that I'm going to destroy their city. And so instead of heading east, Jonah heads west. And he goes and he gets in the boat and he tries to go farther away from God, but God does not let him get too far, right? And we know the rest, we know the, 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 the the one thing we all know about the story of Jonah, right, is he gets thrown out of the boat and into the water and he gets swallowed by a big fish. And soon after three days, he gets puked up on the shore. And then God comes again and a second time and says, go to Nineveh, and, and Jonah goes. God comes at us a second time to call us, to command us to come and to follow and there'll be many people who would say, yes, yes, I'll go, but there'll be 
Yes, but. Yes, but can I really, can I do that and still kind of do my own dreams and try to be rich and famous? Yes, I can follow, but can I maybe sleep in a little later and do it on my own time? Yes, but do I really have to leave every, everything behind? Can't we figure out a way to put a U-Haul on the back of something and haul it along with us? But that's what we understand because we know God's calling sometimes messes up our life. God's time is not like our time. It's different. And that's what the gospel of Mark seems to bring that urgency about it. There's that immediacy that comes. Kind of a little bit of what Paul is trying to get at in, in his writing to the, the people of Corinth. Now, we've took some verses a little bit out of a larger context, but I think the last verse says of what we need to hear. Right? To remind us that we also need to be vigilant because Christ's return is about to take place. But maybe we, like many, have lost that sense of urgency. But since law left us some 2,000 years ago as we continue to wait for his coming. But God's kingdom has come near. God's time has broken into our time. And the words of, of Paul maybe say it in a little different way that we can help understand. Right? When Paul says this very present form of the world is passing away. Paul is trying to remind the people, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by the business of life, the minor things of life that you consider to be too important. But in reality, they all just get in the way of being able to come and to follow Jesus when Jesus calls us to get up and to go. So what does it mean to have been called? What does it mean to be commanded to get up and to follow? One of the ways we might consider is to take heart Take to heart those very words we hear at the end of every worship. As we prepare to, to, to leave worship when we're gathered, or as you prepare to, to get on to the rest of your day after you turn this service off this morning and get on to your week, or for those who come to the parking lot as they prepare to pull away, what does it mean when at the end of worship we say, go in peace and serve the Lord? Or what does it mean, as we will hear today, go in peace, be the light of Christ? Because don't let it be that just that passive response of thanks be to God. Because those words that we hear, just like Jesus' words to come and follow, are not a request. They are a command. They are to command to go in peace, to serve the Lord. Or, as we will hear today, to go in peace and to be the light of Christ. It is not a request, but a command. To live that example, to be the best, to do the best of our ability to step into that void that has been left. To proclaim in word and deed that the kingdom of God has come near. That God's time has come. And that we too have been called to go and to serve and to be. To fulfill the mission and our calling to share the good news of God in Christ Jesus, which has already begun. Amen. We will sing our hymn, You Have Come Down by the Lakeshore.
living together in trust and hope, we are bold to say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. We pray for the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, deacons and deaconesses, and musicians and servers that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, birds and fish, favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth. Let us pray. Amen. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have Amen. mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcast and all who await relief, especially Kelly, Jeff, Arlene, Judy, Connie, Bob, James, Karen, Linda, Dennis, Carolyn, Ken, Steve, Marcy, Stan, and Don, that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith who whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have, Have mercy, mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. So it is, we come again to the time we gather around Christ's table, so I invite you to get those elements ready at home if you have them. Here again we are reminded that Christ gathered with those disciples who left everything to go and to follow him. That he gathered with them on that last night, and they had a supper together, and after supper they took he, Jesus took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take any... This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took cup. And he gave thanks, and he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us join together in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I invite you to take the bread, for this is the body of Christ given for you. and the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in eternal life. Amen. We'll continue with some special music this morning. Oh, my Lord. 
May God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.